Welcome to this video on registration. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'm going to talk to you about cost functions, interpolation and masks in this video which is going to get to some of the details about registration. So I mentioned in one of the other lectures, one of the things that you need to know about are a range of different concepts that go behind registration so that when you are presented with choices and options you know what they mean and how to choose the best one so that you get the most accurate registration. With respect to cost functions, they're simply a way that the algorithm for the registration knows how to quantify whether two images are aligned or not. So consider the two images that we've got down here on, at the bottom on the left hand side. You can see that those two are not aligned. The human visual system is great, we can easily see that. But in order to actually run the registration algorithm, we need a way of quantifying how much um, they are in alignment or how far out of alignment they are. And that's what the cost function does. One way would be what's shown here. If we subtract the two images from each other, if they were well aligned, it would be zero everywhere. It would be a flat image. But actually, what you see is a grayscale sort of flat background, which represents the zero, and then areas which are dark and light. And either of those represent mismatches between the two images, which would be less when the images were better matched. And so we could quantify that by summing up those values are actually squaring them and summing them up, which would be least squares, and that would be a cost function, such that the smaller the value was, the closer to zero, the better it was, the better that alignment was. And that's simply all a cost function is doing, is assigning a number so that the smallest number represents a better alignment. Similarity functions are exactly the same thing, they're just the opposite way around. They try to get the maximum value when the alignment is good. So as the alignment gets better, those values get higher. And similarity functions are simply the opposite of cost functions. If you multiply one function by minus one, you get the other one. And so that's all they are. So we they're interchangeable. We're going to talk about cost functions. There are two different tools available in, in FSL in order to do registration. One is a linear tool, which is called FLIRT, FIMRIB's Linear Image Registration Tool. And that actually has a lot of different cost functions available. In this table, we show you the different ones that, which are available, and we're not going to take you through any of the details because you don't actually need to know the mathematics behind them or how they work. What you need to know is which are the ones that are most appropriate to use in different circumstances. The two on the top here, which are in red, are ones that you can only use when you've got the same modality. That is, you've got a T1 weighted image and another T1 weighted image, not a T1 weighted image and T2 weighted image. So the same modality doesn't mean two MRI images, it means the same type or modality of MRI as well. And for least squares, it has to be exactly the same to all the parameters, so the, the intensity is pretty much identical. For normalized correlation, there can be an overall change in brightness and contrast, and that's still fine, which allows it to be a little bit more flexible with, say, changing some of the values like TE or TR within your T1 weighted image sequence. So it's still T1 weighted, but the contrast might be different. So both of those work very well when you've got the same modality. If you've got different modalities, like a T1 and T2 weighted, they will not work and you cannot use them. So those two just should not be used in that circumstance. If you've got two different modalities, you need to use any of the four below in blue. The default we use is correlation ratio and that can cope with any two different MR modalities or MRI modalities. Mutual information can also cope with two different MRI modalities, but it can also cope with MR and other things like CT or PET, where the images are much more different and they're showing you different aspects of the tissues which are there, such as CT it shows bone very strongly, whereas MR can't distinguish between bone and air, for instance. Mutual information still works well in that instance, but correlation ratio doesn't work so well. So mutual information, the most flexible, they can work with very different images or they could work with two different MR images, or they work with the same modality. They work with any of those. As you go up the table, you get more restrictive. So correlation ratio, any two different MRI images are fine. And the top two has to be the same modality. The very bottom line, BBR, is something that we'll come back to when we discuss EPI distortion correction. It's a very tailored cost function, really, which is designed for EPI, which is what we use when we're getting functional diffusion images, too structural for doing that registration, and particularly for incorporating distortion correction. The other tool that we have is the nonlinear version of registration. We simply call that FNERT, so we replace the linear with the nonlinear. 
And this is quite different in terms of cost functions because there's only one that's available and that's least squares. And that means that there's a constraint on our nonlinear registration tool. It can only work with two images of the same modality because that was the restriction that we had for least squares. It can only work with a T1 weighted image and another T1 weighted image. Now in practice, that actually doesn't limit us very much because we normally use nonlinear registration for looking at registrations between different subjects or between a subject and the standard space template. And we have a T1 weighted template. We can also find a T2 weighted template and other kinds of templates. We normally have a T1 weighted image of our subject, a structural image, which is a T1 weighted sequence. And so we can easily do that registration either between two different subjects or between the subject and the template image with still having the same modality. So that doesn't really restrict us at all. Then within subject, we might have different modalities, but we would be using linear registration for that. So we can only use the same modality for our nonlinear tool because it uses least squares, but that doesn't really hamper us in practice. But one thing that we do have to incorporate it and make it a little bit different from just plain least squares is that it also incorporates a model of the bias field. And that's the RF inhomogeneity, which means that part of the image in MR is darker than it should be and part of it is lighter. You can see in the image on the bottom left here that the posterior half, that the bottom half is brighter than the top half. And that's the kind of thing that we see in bias fields. Large areas of the image which are darker than uh, other areas. And what nonlinear registration can do, if it doesn't understand this bias field, it doesn't have a model for it, is that it can say, okay, in areas where it's darker than it should be, it can actually raise the average intensity by squeezing the gray matter together to make less of it and expanding the white matter. Similarly, at the posterior end, where it's brighter than it should be, it can expand the gray matter and contract the white matter in order to bring the average intensity down. And it will do that because the template has a uniform intensity throughout the white matter and uniform but different intensity throughout the gray matter. And so in order to match that better, it will try and play these games of sort of squeezing gray matter and so forth or expanding it in order to change the average because it, it doesn't like there being an intensity difference. By incorporating a model of the bias field, we can actually alleviate that. And what you see on the bottom right hand side is the case where we have incorporated that model. And in the two red circled areas, you can see the difference. In the one on the right hand side, the cortex is a similar thickness throughout, whereas on the one on the left hand side, it's actually thinned that cortex, it squeezed the gray matter at the front. Whereas the back is actually expanded it on the left hand side, where there was no modeling done, and it's kept it at the much normal level on the right hand side. So that's one of the things we build in to our nonlinear cost function, which is a little bit different, but really helps us in this nonlinear instance. We can also turn that off. It's an option if you were dealing with, say, quantitative images with it, which had a T1 value, so a T1 relaxometry, then you might want to turn it off because you wouldn't want to alter those values. You want to keep them quantitative. But for the kinds of things that we normally deal with, we would leave it on. Even if we've done bias field correction before, it might not be perfect, it's still useful to leave it on. If there was nothing for this to model, that's fine. It will just model nothing and will still give a good registration. If there was any residual bias field left, this is helpful. So that's cost functions. Now I'll talk a little bit about interpolation. And interpolation is what we need in order to fill in values between the grid points. So if you imagine we start with a white grid that you can see here. That's our original image. And actually all that we know, we know the intensity values at the points, the intersections of those grid lines, those white points, because that's all an image is, it's an array of numbers. When we rotate the image to get the yellow grid, then we're actually gonna be interested in what's the value at those grid points, which don't align with the white grid points. So in that big yellow point that you can see, I will be interested to know what the value of that should be in my rotated image, but I don't know what it is from the white image because I only know the values of the white grid points. So I need an interpolation function to figure that out. And there are various different options. One of them is nearest neighbor, which is shown here. And all that does is find the nearest white grid point and copy that value. So here that is highlighted in red, you would simply copy that value. All of these have pros and cons. Nearest neighbor, 
is good in terms that it can be fast, but not so good in terms that it can lead to nasty edges. Another option is trilinear or bilinear if you're in 2D, and that takes the immediate neighbors in, in the white grid, which you can see highlighted in red here, and it creates a weighted average of those points in order to work out the yellow value. The weighting is done according to the distance to the red point in question. So it figures out what the distance is to each of those points, weights them accordingly. The ones which are closest get the highest weights. The weighting function is a linear function, which is why it has this name. It is again quite fast, but it can blur the image a little bit. So again, pros and cons. And the other option includes even more points around. And that might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually quite good for modeling larger boundaries and getting sharp features better than it is when it's just using the local area. So the advantage of these methods, spline being the most common, but they're all, they give you fairly similar things, is that you will actually end up with sharper looking boundaries, but there can be a disadvantage in that it doesn't constrain the range of your outputs and it can lead to a thing called ringing where you end up with values which are smaller than the minimum value in the image you started with, values which are larger than the maximum value. So if you started with an FA image, for instance, which went which was meant to be between zero and one, and you did a spline interpolation, then you might find that you had values which were negative and some values which were greater than one. And that may not be a problem in some circumstances, or that could be a big problem in other ones. And it depends what you want and what is the, the best option in the particular instance that you're working with. Just to give you a visual idea of what I was talking about, here are three images, all the same image. I'm gonna rotate them by the same amount, but with different interpolation functions. Here's nearest neighbor. You can see that the edges now become blocky. It doesn't look quite so nice around the edge. Here's trilinear, much smoother around the edge, but actually a lot of the internal detail is also smoothed by comparison with what it is before it's rotated. And if I use spline, then I actually keep a bit more of the detail than I had before. It's a bit less smooth than trilinear. So they all have pros and cons. Depending on what you're going to do with the image depends on well, what you care about most. Often we're going to use it for quantitative imaging later on, and depending on the models that we're using, that might be important. For instance, if we were assuming that it was FA and it had to stay within a given range, we might not want to use spline. Quite often we, use, we do use trilinear when we're going to do quantitative imaging for something like fMRI, because actually a little bit of smoothness can benefit us statistically even. Another thing that we sometimes are concerned about is size of artifacts. So if you have a particularly large value somewhere, which is maybe an artifactual thing, maybe it was caused by inflow in a blood vessel or something like that, nearest neighbor or trilinear are gonna keep that very contained, very close to that where that original point was, or the vessel was. Spline, however, can spread that over a larger area and you can have these ripples going out. And so that, again, could be a problem that you might want to avoid. So these are all common options used in different circumstances. Another thing that's worth understanding now that we've got this sort of bigger picture of everything is how we split things up and how we call different steps. So we've talked about spatial transformations and which ones you might pick. And one of the things that a registration algorithm will do is to estimate a transformation. And so if you look at the two images here, that might simply be saying, okay, I need to rotate by 30 degrees. That would be the estimated transformation which would relate these two images together. Knowing that it's a 30 degree rotation is it. That's the estimate. It doesn't require the formation of a new image or no resampling. Resampling step would be applying that in order to create a new image, like I've just done at the bottom there. I've taken the original image. I've applied a 30 degree rotation in order to create a new image, which is a rotated version of that original one. For that, I needed to use interpolation. And because all of the interpolations are not perfect, they all come with some slight degradation in image quality. And so we often are concerned about that. Registration itself as a term can mean either. It can mean estimating the transformation on its own or that combined with the resampling step. But because of this change in image quality, we often delay resampling. In particular, we avoid multiple resampling. So if we've got multiple stages of registration, we'd often combine the transformations together and do a single resampling step. And so that's why it's useful to know that these things can be broken apart, because you'll often see that in larger pipelines.
and try and avoid multiple interpolations just because it reduces the quality each time you apply it. Other terms which are good to know are co-registration, which is just really registration because it's registration of two different things together. So it's really the same thing. And spatial normalization, which is a bit more specific, where that is actually registration to a normalized image or a standard template. And so whenever we register the standard space, that's doing spatial normalization. Just another way of saying registration to standard space. And then finally, I want to talk about what happens when we've got masks or binary masks. So on the top there, I'm showing a binary mask, which is the black and white. There are some red outlines overlaid on that just to give you a visual idea of where things are. But the actual binary mask is just the black and the white parts, which represent a re region of interest in this case. And we'd often use them to represent regions of interest and in particular structures. And we're often interested in transforming those from one space to another space. And when we do that, we need to use interpolation. One of the best ways that you can do that is actually to use trilinear interpolation so that the outputs that you get are no longer just zeros and just ones, but they also represent values in between, particularly when they're on the edge of these masks, because it represents the amount of overlap that you've got between the new voxel and, one of, and the old voxels which you had. And the usefulness of that is that then we can threshold that value and we can say that everything above the threshold ends up with a value of one and is included in the mask. Everything below the threshold is set to zero and is excluded. And by changing the value of that threshold, we can be conservative or inclusive. If I threshold near zero at say 0.1, everything with more than 10% overlap with the original mask would be included. And so that will be a little bit over-inclusive which might be useful if I'm actually wanting to make sure that I've definitely included everything. So maybe I had some CSF. I wanted to make sure that I definitely included all voxels which had any CSF within them. Alternatively, I might threshold near one, say 0.9. And I might use that if I want to be very conservative. So say I've got a hippocampus and I want to find the average value of something within the, the hippocampus. But I want to make sure it's not contaminated by anything outside the hippocampus. If I do that, then everything every voxel has to have at least 90% overlap with the hippocampus mask before it's included. And so I'm going to be conservative and make sure that I'm not really get, getting much contamination from outside. I could obviously raise that threshold even higher to 0.99 if I was really concerned. Or I could set the threshold at 0.5 and keep the size approximately the same. Because actually the size is going to vary with the threshold. Because if I use a high threshold like 0.9, then I'm actually going to have a smaller area, which is shown in green here. If I have 0.5, then I would have what you'd see in blue, plus all the area in green still. So it still includes that, that inner core, but I'd have a few more voxels around the edge in blue. If I have 0.1, then I'd actually have anything which is colored there. So the green, the blue, and the red would all be included in something which was a 0.1 threshold. So that gives you some control over how conservative or inclusive you want to be. And that's all that I want to say in this video. So we've looked at the fact that there are different cost functions and that there are often multiple valid choices that you can make, but often you need to make a choice. Often it will be included as a default within a pipeline, but it's very good to check, particularly if you're doing anything which is unusual. Interpolation is used to resample the images. It's again, often set within the tool, but when you want to do something like applying it to a mask, then you need to choose something appropriately and that can include a threshold. And often when you want to apply multiple transforms, we would delay resampling, avoid multiple resamplings in order to retain image quality.